Thanks for the intro. I'll be talking today about proactive. So proactive is a method used to estimate promoter activity from rna seq data. And uh, it was actually developed by a PhD student, Dennis from uh, the Genome Institute of Singapore. And uh, together we helped to develop the package for bioconductor submission. Yeah. So to motivate proactive, I'll talk briefly about gene expression. So we know that for a single gene, multiple isoforms can be transcribed. This gene here, for example, has five isoforms with um, differing start sites, differing stop sites, and also um, different coding sequences. So we know that many different mechanisms regulate the expression of gene isoforms. So for instance, we have alternative splicing, variable promoter usage, and also the use of different end sites. So all these uh, different factors contribute to isoform diversity. And in particular, we want to focus on promoters because they play a key role in integrating signals from distant enhancers, as well as from transcription factor binding or from other epigenetic modifications. Um, all these factors also give rise to a change in gene and isoform expression. Yeah. So from the late 90s to early 2000s, alternative promoters began to be studied. And it's now well documented that more than 80% of protein coding genes use alternative promoters. And the use of alternative promoters has been implicated in diseases, in particular cancers. And thus, it's important to understand the role of promoters and their clinical implications, and also how they regulate transcriptome. Uh, in particular, we want to answer a few questions. So firstly, we want to be able to identify the promoters in the genome. And secondly, we also want to quantify how active these promoters are. And also lastly, we want to ask how does the choice of promoter affect um, the transcriptome? Yeah. So to answer these questions, Proactive uses data from both genomic annotations and RNA-seq data. So genomic annotations are first used to identify promoters, and RNA-seq data is then used to estimate the activity at each annotated promoter. So this is a rough scheme of how Proactive works. With annotation and rna seq data, we can identify the annotated promoters and then quantify them. And uh, I'll now go into the methods in more detail. So in this example, we have a gene with five isoforms. And when we measure gene expression, we are essentially flattening, flattening out the five isoforms and measuring the sum of their expressions. On the other extreme, we can also estimate the expression of each isoform. But studies show that gene expression is more robust than isoform expression due to limitations in short read sequencing technologies. So proactive lies between these two extremes. First, we can see that the transcription start sites of some of the isoforms are very close to each other. And also we know that um, a single promoter can regulate multiple transcription start sites. So we can annotate the promoters as such and also uh, we group isoforms with overlapping first exons and then estimate the promoter activity as the total transcription initiated from each group. Um, another simplifying assumption is that we only consider reads that allow us to uniquely distinguish each isoform from another and then use that as a measure of transcription. So this is a summary of how proactive works. Once the promoters are identified and quantified, we can measure how active each promoter is at the gene level. So now I'll talk about uh, applications for proactive. So we apply proactive uh, to a pan cancer transcript forming analysis uh, to data from three projects the PCAWG, TCGA, and GTEx projects. So in total, we had about 18,000 samples covering over 40 cancer types. And to see whether our estimates for promoter activity were reliable or not, we use uh, chip seq and chip tag data from the ENCODE and Phantom projects. So what we expect is that uh, more active promoters should be associated with uh, higher methylation levels and also more cage tag support because these are indicators of active transcription. And sure enough, this was what we found. So on the figure on the left shows a heat map of the mean promoter activity from rna seq data on the horizontal axis and the mean H3K4 methylation we count from chip data on the vertical axis, as you can see here. 
As expected, promoters with the highest activity estimates show higher methylation levels. And in addition, the promoter activity estimates also correlate the most with methylation signals for samples with matching tissue types. And the figure on the right shows the percentage of pH tech support for promoters of different activity levels. So it's, you can see that uh, promoters with higher activity levels are associated with more uh, pH tech support. So these validation results suggest that Proactive can reliably identify active promoters in the genome. Once we had that, we also found that promoter activity is dominated by tissue and cell type. So on the left, there's a TSNI plot using the top 1,500 promoters with the highest variance in promoter activity. And as you can see, the tissues, uh, tissue types cluster quite well together. And we can also look at the contribution of each promoter to overall gene expression. So the figure on the right shows the comparison between major promoter activity, the vertical axis, which represents the most active promoter of each gene, compared to the average gene expression, which is the sum of all promoter activity estimates for a particular gene. So on the diagonal lies all the single promoter genes, while multi-promoter genes lie to the right of the diagonal. And uh, this plot clearly shows that a single promoter often doesn't fully explain gene expression. And we also have to consider minor promoters as they contribute to isoform diversity. Another interesting finding was that uh, we also found tissue-specific use of alternative promoters that regulate the use of existing isoforms. So GJB1 gene is an example of this. As you can see, uh, this figure on the left shows the average read count for the gene locus in a central, central nervous system tissue compared to all other tissues. And we see that uh, GJB1 gene has two alternative promoters, uh, highlighted here in light blue and red. And as you can see, the first promoter, highlighted in light blue, is uh, deregulated in CNS tissues exclusively, while the second promoter, highlighted in red, is a uh, active in CNS tissue while it's not active at all in other tissues. Yeah. But interestingly, when we look in terms of the overall gene expression between CNS and other tissues, we don't really see um, a change, a significant difference. This shows a tissue-specific use of alternative promoters. We also found that uh, promoter usage is specific to cancer subtype. So the figure on the left again shows the immediate count at the star 2 locus for basal subtype of breast cancer compared to all other subtypes of breast cancer. And the three most active promoters are highlighted in the figure again. And we can see that the three prime most promoter, highlighted in red, displays subtype specific activity for basal uh, breast cancer samples, while the other two promoters show comparable or higher activity levels in all the subtypes. And again, there was no much difference in the overall expression of star 2 between the basal subtype and the rest of the subtypes. And this shows that cancer tumors with different molecular characteristics can be associated with alternative promoter usage. Yeah. Another interesting thing we found was that uh, alternative promoter usage can be associated with patient survival. So an example of this is with the ARBB2 gene, which is a known cancer gene that is associated with aggressive tumor types. And ARBB2 uses Two promoters in lower grade glomas, uh, P1 here and P2. So if we look at the survival curves, you can see that P2 is predictive of poor survival outcome, whereas P1 shows no significant association with patient survival. So this suggests that patient to patient variation in promoter activity might provide a more accurate predictor for genes that use multiple promoters. So now I'll talk briefly about the proactive workflow. So recall that proactive takes us input genomic annotations and RNA seq data. So in order to create promoter annotations, uh, proactive accepts genomic annotations in the form of GTFs or transcript databases. And to estimate proactive and promoter activity, proactive uses RNA seq in the form of junction files from top hat or star lines and also from best hubs. So I'll go through briefly the main steps and functions in a sample workflow, summarized in this vignette here, which can be found at the prediction page posted at this URL. So to create promoter annotations, you can simply call the prepare promoter annotation function, which takes in either a TXDB object or a 
GTF or GFF file directly. These uh, data can be easily downloaded for, uh, from Genco, for example. And, uh, this function call returns a promoter annotation object, which is a custom class containing information used downstream to quantify promoter activity. So once the promoter annotation object is created, we can then call proactive, uh, which returns a summarized experiment, giving the estimated promoter counts and activity for each annotated promoter. So the function takes as input junction of bank counts, and also the promoter annotation created earlier. It also takes in optionally a condition vector, which describes the condition for each input file. If this is applied, the results will be summarized based on the condition. And parallel processing is also implemented for a large number of input sample files. So to identify alternative promoters, we found that DXSeq, which although designed for differential axon usage, can also identify promoters that are differentially regulated for a particular gene. So DXSeq takes uh, promoter counts as input, along with several other arguments, which I won't uh, go through here. And uh, you can find the workflow described in more detail in the vignette. So anyway, after we call DXSeq on uh, the data, we get output that looks something like this. So, this is a DXSeq run on RNA-seq data that we provide with the package. And here we are looking for uh, alternative promoter use between two cell lines, FG2 and A5 for nine. And so you can see um, the top range gene here is red one gang. And in particular, we identify uh, three significantly uh, differentially used promoters. So we can visualize these results with a plotting function. So this is the plot generated by practice plotting function. And on the top half, you can see it displays the transcript model for the gene of interest. And on the bottom, it shows the activity estimates for the two cell lines, A549 and FG2. And this plot, it confirms that there's indeed alternative promoter usage between the two cell lines for this particular gene. And from a quick glance, we can also see that this particular isoform might be upregulated uh, only the A549 cell line compared to the FG2 cell. So to generate the plot you just saw, you can simply call the plot promoters function, which takes the summarized experiment return from proactive as input, along with a gene of interest. You can also supply a TXDB, which helps to visualize the gene model shown here. So proactive will be available in the next product release. And in the meantime, you can find the workflow presented here today at the packages homepage hosted at this URL. And acknowledgements go to Dennis, whose findings were presented here today, and also wrote the software. And uh, Jonathan, who was a supervisor and co-author, and also helped to develop the package for backing up the submission. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Joseph. So uh, it is 11.29 now. We have time for one question, if anyone has a question. Just post it on our chat board. Hey, do you, uh, we got a question from Julie. Do you think the three prime RNA seq method is more biased? So I would like to just say it <laughs> because <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> And so, in, in terms of three prime RNA seq based method, um, uh, if it's in the transfer is longer, then it might not get a sequenced um, for the uh, promote the the uh, five prime exon. Um, that's do you observe any, you know, bias uh, in your promoter activity assessment in terms? Yeah. Mm. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I think uh, depends on really the, the coverage of the, the sequencing. Yeah, so I think uh, in terms of the study that we did, the uh, pan cancer transcriptome study, there was not really uh, any detected bias that we found. Yeah, so it also correlated quite well with the GC data. Uh, so we believe that the estimates are reliable. Thank you, Joseph, for your great talk. So let's move to the next talk.